Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. On the news hour tonight, an exclusive interview with South Korea's foreign minister, Kang Kyung Hwa. We discuss President Trump's trade threats and diplomacy with the North. We're cautiously optimistic uh, that the, the talks will happen and that this will be a breakthrough for a peaceful resolution of the North Korean nuclear issue. Then the Trump administration accuses Russia of an aggressive hacking campaign targeting U.S. power plants and water systems. And it's Friday, Mark Shields and David Brooks weigh in on the revolving door at the White House and Pennsylvania's stunning election upset. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. The death toll rose to six today in that pedestrian bridge collapse in South Florida, and it could go higher still. The newly installed span fell onto a highway yesterday at Florida International University. Today, the head of the Miami-Dade police said crews expect to find more bodies as they remove the crushed wreckage. They are also looking for clues. Right now, we just want to find out what occurred, what caused this collapse to occur, and people to die. We want to get to the bottom of this, uh, the, the bottom line of what occurred so that we can bring closure to the families, bring closure to the investigation, and so that it doesn't happen again. Federal investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board have also joined the investigation. The White House played down talk today of another impending shakeup, namely that President Trump plans to fire National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster. It was widely reported that the president has complained of McMaster lecturing him and that the two clashed over Iran and North Korea. But at today's briefing, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said it's much ado about nothing. The president uh, said that it was not accurate and he had no intention of changing, that they had a great working relationship and he looked forward to continue working with them. Uh, the chief of staff actually uh, spoke to a number of staff this morning, uh, reassuring them that there were uh, personnel changes, uh, no immediate personnel changes at this time, uh, and that people shouldn't be concerned. We Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal reported that Mr. Trump and his chief of staff, John Kelly, have reached a truce of their own after months of tensions. The lawyer for porn film star Stephanie Clifford says that she has been threatened with bodily harm if she did not remain silent about an alleged sexual affair with President Trump. He gave no details and would not say if someone tied to Mr. Trump made the threat against Clifford, who was known as Stormy Daniels. The White House said the president condemns anyone who threatens any individual. The diplomatic divide between London and Moscow deepened today, with British police saying that a Russian businessman may have been murdered. Nikolai Glushkov was found dead Monday in London, where he had won political asylum in 2010. Investigators say they think he was strangled. His death followed a nerve agent attack on a former Russian spy in Salisbury, England. Emma Murphy of Independent Television News reports from Moscow. The imagery couldn't have been lost on the president. In the middle of an international crisis about where a lethal chemical agent was produced, he appeared in a white coat in a Russian laboratory. And it seems imagery wasn't lost on the foreign secretary either, Boris Johnson appearing in a military bunker to point the finger of blame directly at the Russian leader. Our quarrel is with Putin's Kremlin and with his decision and we think it overwhelmingly likely that it was his decision to direct the use of a nerve agent on the streets of, of the UK, on the streets of Europe, for the first time since the Second World War. The response from the Kremlin was immediate. Though what action will be taken against British interests hasn't yet been announced, the Foreign Secretary's accusations were described as shocking and unforgivable. The Russian Foreign Minister was in no mood for discussion. I don't want to comment on what's happening anymore, Sergei Lavrov said, and let it stay on the consciousness of those who started this shameless, unjustified Russia-phobic game. Evgeny Primakov is a foreign policy advisor to the Russian parliament. He's also a close associate of the president and part of his re-election team. I would describe it as 
are something very close to the very darkest days of uh, Cold War. What do you think happened in Salisbury? I'm pretty sure it was a very, very dirty game of some special security services and those services were not Russian. And perhaps that is the only bit of common ground between the UK and Moscow. There is indeed a very dirty game being played. That report from Emma Murphy of Independent Television News. On the cusp of Russia's presidential election, Vladimir Putin is urging his people to get out and vote. He is expected easily to win another six-year term in Sunday's balloting. But as opposition candidates held their final rallies today and some urged a boycott, Putin put out a recorded message to boost turnout. We in Russia have always decided our fate ourselves. I'm sure that each and every one of us is worried about the fate of our country. So I'm addressing you to ask you to come to the polling stations. Use your right to choose the future for the great and beloved Russia. Putin's public approval ratings top 80 percent. Russian and Syrian airstrikes rain more death today outside Damascus as civilians ran for their lives. Thousands were fleeing the rebel enclave of eastern Ghouta in Syria toward government lines. But war monitors say that air attacks killed at least 70 people. In northwestern Syria, Turkish air assaults left 27 dead in Kurdish-held Afrin. The Turks say the Kurds are linked to rebels inside Turkey. In western Iraq, the U.S. military says seven American service members were killed when their helicopter crashed. It happened Thursday in Anbar province near the Syrian border. Officials say there was no indication of enemy fire. As of last fall, about 9,000 U.S. troops were stationed in Iraq. Former South African President Jacob Zuma will face corruption charges over an arms deal from the 1990s. The chief prosecutor announced it today. The 75-year-old Zuma served as president for nearly nine years, but his tenure was marred by scandal. He resigned under pressure last month. Back in this country, the oldest sitting member of Congress, Louise Slaughter, died today at a Washington hospital, a week after falling at her home. The New York Democrat represented the Rochester area for more than 30 years. She championed women's rights and was the first woman to chair the House Rules Committee. Louise Slaughter was 88 years old. And on Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained nearly 73 points to close at 24,946. The Nasdaq rose just a fraction, and the S&P 500 added four. For the week, all three indexes lost more than 1%. Still to come on the NewsHour, new reports beg the question, could Russia shut down the U.S. power grid? Mark Shields and David Brooks on the White House's revolving door. Impressions of the southern border from Arizona's Equation. first poet laureate, and much system. more. President Trump spoke this morning with President Moon Jae-in of South Korea, just one week after the surprise offer of a possible summit between Mr. Trump and North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un. Moon's foreign minister, Kang Kyung-hwa, is here in Washington to continue consultation with the Trump administration and Congress, a trip that almost didn't happen after Tuesday's firing of her counterpart, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. Minister Kang and I spoke earlier today, and I began by asking her about President Trump's recent apparent threats to pull American troops from South Korea if the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, or CORUS FTA, is not improved in the United States' favor. Well, I think the strength of the Korea-U.S. alliance is solid enough to not take comments related to trade as, uh, as indicating something about the trip presence itself. And we are having um, a session of renegotiating the CORUS FDA. Um, we very much hope and expect the result to be mutually beneficial and, and uh, something that takes the FDA further in a way that benefits both countries. Is your government prepared to make concessions on trade? I think as deals go, there has to be concessions both ways. The president also said in, in his remarks this week, he said, uh, our allies care about themselves, they don't care about us. How do you read that? 
I think every country thinks of um, their national interest in the first instance. We do, the U.S. does, all countries. Um, I think it has, that, that has to be read in that context and not, not taken at face value. Well, let's turn to the proposed talks between uh, President Trump and the leader of North Korea, uh, Mr. Kim. How confident are you that those talks are going to take place? Any question that they'll happen? Well, I think um, this is the result of our special envoy's direct discussion with uh, Chairman Kim. So I'm pretty confident. I'm, you know, I think we're cautiously optimistic uh, that the, the talks will happen and that this will be a breakthrough for a peaceful resolution of the North Korean nuclear issue. So what conditions have to be met? in your view, before these talks can take place on both sides? I think very much the conditions that the U.S. has, has so far emphasized. That is, um, the North Korean leader has to indicate his commitment to denuclearization has been met. That was one of the key points that came out of the special envoys meeting and then conveyed to President uh, Trump. The other was that they need to stop the provocations. And again, clearly stated by the leader himself, no more provocation as long as the, as the dialogue continues. So I think the basic condition that we have been flagging, uh, the U.S. has been flagging, has basically been met. Could there be new sanctions imposed on North Korea before any talks take place? Well, I think the international community uh, together has been um, has been implementing the Security Council sanctions. Uh, and that certainly has been one of the factors that has led Mr. Kim to come out and, and start engaging. The Security Council, so yes, if there are further provocations, there will be more sanctions. Uh, but Mr. Kim has, um, Chairman Kim has uh, clearly stated that there will be no further provocation as long as the dialogues continue. Does your government trust the leader of North Korea? I mean, the people who watch North Korea closely say it has violated every agreement it's entered into uh, in, in recent history. It's not a matter of trusting. Uh, it's a matter of approaching the opportunity presented with goodwill, and uh, we have. We have, my president has been from the very beginning, uh, consistent and persistent in his message about North Korea. And that message has been North Korea's missiles nuclear program will never be accepted. But we want to engage to find a way towards a peaceful resolution. This is a much better situation, I think we all agree, than uh, we found ourselves um, mid last year or even at the end of last year. You mentioned the sanctions imposed on the North. Why do you think uh, the leader, their leader, Kim Jong-un, wants this meeting? I mean, after all the effort, all the energy, resources they've poured into building up their nuclear weapons program that can strike the United States, certainly strike countries in the region, why does he want this meeting? The sanctions uh, and the solidarity of the international community behind the sanctions are, by all accounts, having an effect. Uh, the chairman has promised two things uh, to his people. One is the nuclear program, and one is economic development, improvement of livelihoods. And this was a part clearly stated in his near message. And, and to make progress on the second track, uh, he needs, he cannot do this, deliver this with, with under the heavy sanctions regime. So he, he would understand that he needs to work with the international community, in the first instance, the United States, um, to, to ease the sanctions regime. And, and that's not going to happen unless and until he, um, unless he takes significant steps on the denuclearization track. Do you have a goal, does your government have a goal in mind, should the U.S. have a goal in mind of what that denuclearization looks like? I mean, how far does it have to go for there to be an agreement? Well, we are very clear in, in our um, stated goal of complete denuclearization of North Korea. Um, and it, it will take a long while because the program is very advanced. 
So from a very well advanced program to complete denuclearization obviously will take a long time. And we're prepared for the long haul, but we, uh, we, uh, we approach this with, um, with clear eyes and uh, with uh, nerves of steel, uh, but with a clear goal in mind. What concession should South Korea and the U.S. be prepared to make for there to be an agreement? And could it include removing or reducing the number of U.S. troops in South Korea? I think the issue of the U.S. presence in South Korea is very much uh, an issue that needs to be discussed, an issue for the, for the alliance. and and. Um, I don't think that, you know, we you should even think about um, any concessions along those lines. It will not be an issue um, that we, were, we would be read, readily discuss with the, at the table with North Korea. Your president um, is going to meet with uh, Leader Kim mm -hmm. uh, next month. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it, this is in advance of any meeting with, with President uh, Trump. There are those who look at all of this and say South Korea and the United States are conferring uh, a, a level of credibility uh, and respect on the North Korean regime that it has not earned, that it doesn't deserve. How do you answer that? It's a regime still that we need to deal with. Um, it poses a grave uh, security threat to Korea, to the whole world, and you can only deal with this threat by engaging with it. We're absolutely clear that a military solution is not an option. It's, uh, we are a country that have, that have experienced the, the most destructive war um, in, in a lifespan that my father's generations can remember. So there cannot be another war on the Korean Peninsula. This requires a peaceful solution, and to have a peaceful solution, you have to deal with them. You have to negotiate. And how much are you concerned about the fact that you are dealing with the U.S. administration that's undergoing a lot of change at the top? How much harder does that make it to work with the U.S. on this very sensitive issue? Well, it's people, but it's also institutions, um, which is why, despite the, the fact of the change at the top of the State Department, um, I have still decided to come because it's certainly with people you develop a certain camaraderie after a while, but you that comes with part of the job, That's and, and I think that's what uh, professional diplomacy requires. I asked you earlier if you, your government, trusts um, Kim Jong-un. Do you trust President Trump? I have um, confidence in his ability um, to deliver on his, his um, strong desire to come to grips with this uh, issue of the North Korean nuclear and missile threat. Well, Foreign Minister Kong, we thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you, Judy. Now the threat to the U.S. power grid and other vital infrastructure. John Yang has more on newly revealed hacking attacks by Russia here at home. Judy, the Trump administration has accused Russia of a series of cyber attacks on American and European power plants, water facilities, and electrical grids. Officials say the intrusions began in 2015 and continued through last year. While the hackers had their fingers on the switches, so to speak, they apparently did not actually shut off power. The FBI and other agencies tracked the hackers and alleged that Russian intelligence is responsible. For more on these attacks and the wider cyber battlefield, I'm joined by David Kennedy, the founder of TrustedSec, a tech security firm. David, thanks so much for joining us. Now, does this mean that they still have their fingers on those switches and can, can sort of wreak havoc at will? Well, the, the energy grid and, and the water treatment facilities aren't like one interconnected system. So, you know, throughout the United States, there's, number of, there's a number of companies and, and you know, it's, it's a disjointed system. So, you know, the FBI is, you know, working with all of these different companies, trying to find out what level of access they had to try to boot them out. So, you know, there still could be access into the systems. We don't know how widespread this was. And, you know, the Department of Homeland Security didn't really give all of the details. So we don't know 
um, if they're still in the systems, but we just know that they, they were specifically targeting um, a large amount of our infrastructure so that you know, possibly in the event that there was a military conflict, they could po you know, shut us down a uh, large percentage of our, of our infrastructure. So this is, in a way, a threat, or letting them, letting the United States know that they can do this if they wanted to. Well, Russia is being extremely aggressive on a lot of different areas right now, and this is just one of them, on the, especially on the cyber front. Um, but what what uh, nation states typically try to do um, is have what we call military preparedness, where you know, in the event that there's a, some sort of military conflict, and Russia obviously sees uh, Rus uh, Western allies. Um, as being a major threat. So, you know, our European, um, you know, our European allies, the United States, um, all as being major threats towards, you know, Russian dominance, especially when it comes to its allies, you know, Syria, um, Iran, and et cetera. And so, you know, when it comes to that, you know, Russia likes to have an upper hand when it comes to, you know, in the event, you know, there was a conflict between the United States um, and Russia, could, you know, Russia um, have a substantial amount of impact back here in the United States on causing major disruptions, you know, the financial, um, you know, um, could it have a financial impact where it could shut down our financial sector? Um, you know, could it shut down our lights and our power? Um, you know, could it stop water uh, from flowing to our, you know, homes and, and you know, cause water outages? Um, those are all things that, you know, that could cause a substantial amount of damage and pain here back in the United States uh, without even firing a missile. Um, so those are things that Russia uses as far as capabilities um, to, to really try to cause a lot of hurt um, on the United States in the event that something happens. So those are, you know, capabilities that are now um, possible uh, through cyber methods that, that all nation states are looking to develop, not just, you know, Russia, Iran's looking to develop them, North Korea, China, you know, all, obviously, um, you know, uh, you know uh, nation states aren't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, good to the United States when it comes to, to relations. Those are all things that can happen when it comes to cyber capabilities, not necessarily the most you know, military advanced capabilities when it comes to the United States, when we have you know, a lot of times the upper hand. Well, David, you say that, that all nation states are trying to do this. Is the United States developing this against other countries? Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, there was a big leak that happened about a year ago uh, from what was called the Equation Group, which was traced back to the National Security Agency, um, a group called TAO. Um, and, and during this period of time, um, a bunch of Russian hackers um, uh, actually stole a lot of code from the National Security Agency, their, their elite hacking group, and published this code out. And it, and it detailed a lot of what the NSA was actually doing and a lot of the operations that they used uh, to infiltrate a lot of the different um, countries abroad. Um, showed a lot of how they tracked um, through the SWIFT network, which is the financial backbone of, of how they're tracking a lot of money, money laundering towards terrorist organizations and how they're able to track terrorists uh, throughout the world. Uh, so we use these types of capabilities as well. So the United States absolutely has capabilities, cyber capabilities, uh, for launching these. And, and we do the exact same thing. You know, we're hacking into, um, you know, uh, industrial control systems, you know, for, for manufacturing, for, uh, you know, grids, for water treatment facilities. We're doing the exact same things uh, to other countries as military capabilities. Um, it's kind of a, we're going to hack them, they're going to hack us. Um, it's, it's, it's just if we just, we're hoping that we don't get discovered, they're hoping they don't get discovered. Um, it's, it's a military fight right now for cyber warfare. So the cyber warfare is going on? All the time, every day, you know, as we speak, as we're talking right now, uh, there's, there's active hacks that are happening as we're going on right now talking. We're hacking into Russia, Russia's hacking into us, Iran's hacking into us, North Korea's hacking into us, we're hacking into them. It's a, it's a massive battle that's occurring right now. And it's, it's, it's crazy to think about because there's, there's no talk around what this actually means as far as ramifications. And think about it, if, if, if an accident accidentally happens, right, the, a slip up occurs and it shuts down half of our power grid just by mistake, you know, is that an act of war? Does that constitute an act of war where now we're going to start launching missiles at Russia? I mean, this is a, a very delicate situation. And a lot of these systems, you know, you talk about the electric grid. I mean, these systems are, haven't been updated probably in 30, 40, 50 years in some cases. I mean, they're super, super sensitive. Just by, you know, breathing on them the wrong way can shut them down. So, you know, the, the mistakes are going to happen. Um, there's possibility for loss of life. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ramific ramifications that can happen for these types of activities. And uh, we're just seeing the, the tip of the iceberg happening right now. David Kennedy on cyber warfare. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. The Secretary of State is fired. A Democrat claims victory in a conservative stronghold. And that was just on Tuesday. Thankfully, Shields and Brooks are here to help make sense of it all. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields right. and New York Times columnist David Brooks. And we are so glad to see both of you this yes. Friday. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, as we just mentioned, uh, David, there have been 
uh, top people, uh, the Secretary of State, the chief economic advisor to the president. Uh, we could name many others. Uh, there's speculation that a number of cabinet secretaries may go. We're showing a picture of just a few of the names out there. McMaster, the president's national security advisor, may be fired by the president. How do we process all this going on in, in this administration right now? Uh, well, Trump is getting Trumpier, and the administration is getting Trumpier. He's decided that he's, at, in the beginning, he was sort of on the learning curve of the presidency, but he's got it mastered. And so he doesn't need all these people who are telling him no all the time. And so him, it's a process of him feeling comfortable with himself. And it's also a process of him being anti-system. I mean, White House has worked through the system. You've got this vast apparatus, and normally you, it all works together in some form with deputy meetings, deputy deputy meetings, and then principal meetings and all that. Trump sort of resists all that. It, all the, all the process is sort of within here, uh, or maybe lower, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 this is PBS, yes. David. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and, and so he's, he's decided, I don't, I'm happy here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of the people who are making me feel uncomfortable. Mark, uh, should we uh, be uh, wringing our hands over this, or just say, as the White House does, that he's just having people around him who make him comfortable? That's a, it's a new uh, standard for hiring people for jobs. Does he or she make me comfortable, not whether they can contribute to the public wheel and make the country better or, or anything of the sort. I, I want to salute David for coining Trumpy. Uh, which, you know, it's one of the sleepy and, uh, and the, uh, the other seven dwarfs. But, uh, Judy, um, any time you go through sort of this wholesale firing, uh, uh, it's an indication of weakness in a president. Uh, it's a, a political uncertainty. I mean, the two most recent presidents who did it, Gerald Ford in 1975, uh, going through getting rid of Jim Schlesinger, uh, Secretary of Defense, and dropping Nelson Rockefeller from the ticket, was a sign of political weakness. Um, and Jimmy Carter in 1979, when he got rid of five cabinet members, including Schlesinger again, uh, and, uh, and Joe Califano. And it, it, it really is, and that's what you're seeing with Donald Trump. But I think there's a, at a personal level, there are two things that, that have to be commented upon. First of all is that there is about this administration just a fatiguing, draining aspect. People really, Americans are not consumed with politics and policy and government. They, they want somebody who's going to run things and run them in an orderly way. This has been disorderly from day one, and it's draining. Uh, it, it, it really is of, of the nation's, I think, well-being and, and peace of mind. Um, and, and Donald Trump promised that he would bring the best people uh, he knew the best people, they'd all come. Now we've reached the point, quite frankly, uh, where people won't even accept invitations to the White House to be interviewed, or overtures. Um, and he's, he's just, he's running out of, of uh, I think, of personnel, and I, I think he's running out of time politically. But David, the, the president himself says he believes in being disruptive, he believes in sort of rearranging things, uh, being, creating a little chaos. Uh, in so many words. Well, that's true. He's, he's accurate about that. The problem is the staff never knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's just hard to do your job, A, if you don't know what's going to happen, B, if you're constantly being undermined by the president himself. Everyone who's gone in there, whether it's Tillerson, looks smaller coming out. H.R. McMaster is being dangled and dangled and dangled. H.R. Mm -hmm. McMaster had a really sterling reputation going in. He was compelled to not be totally honest early in the administration about what the president told a bunch of Russian diplomats who came. That hurt his reputation. And then it's a process of constantly having to suck up to the president. Gary Cohn, the economic advisor, mm -hmm. let some comments know that he was unhappy with the way the president responded to Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. And so he fell out of favor, out of the quite comments that suggested some integrity on Mr. Cohen's part. And so you've always got to please the prince, uh, and you've always got to play in a princely manner. And what worries me is they never had really access to the Republican A-level staff, but they had the B-level. Uh, and now we're going down to C and D. Um, Larry Kudlow, the new economic appointee, very nice guy. I agree with him on a lot of things. But Phil Tetlock, who's a scholar uh, who studies decision making, I, several years ago identified Kudlow as one of the worst decision makers because he's always driven by ideology. John Bolton has talked about coming in to the National Security Advisor. That's a job where you want somebody neutral. Mm -hmm to let the process work its way. John Bolton, who's a Fox News analyst, is anything but neutral on anything. And so what you just see is uh, worse personnel, more chaos. Do we I, make, go ahead. I, I agree with David, and I just want to underline one point he made. 
um, and, and that is the way it's done, Judy, it, it's public humiliation of the people who do leave. Um, it, well, it, Tillerson, it, it, Tillerson in tweet. particular, but, but I mean, everybody is, is, is demeaned or denigrated in tweets afterwards. And, you know, I, again, I come back to ordinary Americans. Just this is, this is not, this is bullying. This is mean. Uh, this is ugly. Uh, this is not what you want in a president. Finally, just a personal note, and that is 50 years ago today, Robert Kennedy announced his candidacy for president. I was lucky enough to work for him in the primaries in Nebraska and Oregon and California and to got totally unearned status and credit because I'd worked for Robert Kennedy, one of the great men of the 20th century in, in retrospect. And, uh, but unearned benefits. Now people of, of public service, of, of commitment, have gone to work for Donald Trump. They're diminished. They're demeaned. Uh, they're smaller. Uh, they're in a, a cauldron of resentment and revenge in the White House, uh, and they've got legal bills, and they don't know from one day to the next what, whether their job is there and what their job is. And I, I just I feel badly for them, I mean, uh, because every one of them is going to carry that with them. For the rest we'll of say them. one other thing about just having been around a lot of Trump supporters in the last week. Um, they've tuned it out. They, they support the administration. They like the big things about it, the tax bill, the deregulation, that kind of thing. And I always ask them, what about this? What about this? The things we frankly talk about a lot every week. And it just sort of drifts by them unnoticed. And so if you want to know why he's still got 90 percent approval roughly among Republicans, I think that's the answer. A lot of things that would cause most people to shake their heads, they just, it just doesn't rise to the level of consciousness and it just gets tuned out. Well, let's talk about something that happened this week that's connected, but in the political realm, uh, Mark, uh, in Pennsylvania, a district that went, congressional district, special election, Donald Trump won this district near Pittsburgh by 20 points. Mm -hmm. uh, the Democrat won by, what, seven, six, seven hundred votes, very close, but the Democrat appears to have won. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us? Does it say something about the fall midterms? What do we read? It does tell us something about the fall midterms. Someone... Uh, who's lived through an awful lot of midterm elections. The, the, the following, when a president's job rating is below 50%, the president's party loses on average 30, uh, 43 House seats. Um, when a president's below 40%, uh, you're in uncharted territory. Um, what it tells us is the Democrats consistently are far more enthusiastic about 2018 than are the Republicans. The, Repub the Democratic turnout was higher uh, it was 67 percent in Allegheny County as opposed to 60 percent among Republicans. The overall turnout was phenomenal. There were more people voted in the special election on Tuesday than voted in the general election in 2014 when the Pennsylvanians elected a governor. But most of all, and David had a piece about this today, candidates do matter. Connor Lamb was a good candidate. It's the House of Representatives. He, I mean, in Washington, Democrats want to apply an 18-point litmus test, and unless somebody passes every one of them, they can't, they can't support it. Ronald Reagan's dictum is worth heeding. Ronald Reagan said, someone who agrees with us 80% of the time is our valued and cherished ally and friend, and we, we are committed to them. They're not our 20% enemy, and Connor Lamb was a, a good candidate and didn't meet the litmus test, and he can hold that district or any district around it. Is, what do you read into it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, the tides are all in the Democrats' favor. If you looked at the, I saw a scatter graph of the ra races, including state legislature races, in the first uh, eight months of the, of the administration. And it was sort of all over the place. There was a Democrat advantage, but it wasn't universal. In the last four or five months, it's just universal. The Democrats just have this big advantage built in, and that looks pretty baked in for the reasons that Mark said, even despite the great economy. Uh, but to me, the most important thing is, what is the Democratic Party going to look like this year? The only way they can blow it is if they look like, you know, Berkeley, California. And if they indulge, you know, mm -hmm. the inner passions, they could blow this. But in Pennsylvania with Connor Lamb, they didn't blow it. And they didn't blow it on two fronts. The most obvious um, is the having somebody who's a political moderate. Connor Lamb was against the assault weapons ban. He said he won't vote for Speaker Pelosi. He did a whole series of policy things toward the center. To me, that was less important than the character thing. Mm -hmm. I think that people always vote against the president, the style of the president they just had. And I think because of the exhaustion that Mark referred to earlier, a lot of people want to go against the Trump character style. And they want to go to people who have put character first before policy. Connor Lamb, former Marine, comes from a good 
Catholic school, talks about his faith, a long distinguished political family. He just seems like a good guy. And when Trump came in and violated all the norms of normal campaigning in his own district, Connor Lamb did not answer. And so that's, that's a sign of good character. I think that's going to be in special demand this year. Well, we are, we are, it's 2018, and lightning is going to strike me for even bringing up 2020, but I can't resist because this morning in New Hampshire, uh, one of the two Republican senators, one of the re Republican senators not running for re-election, Jeff Flake of Arizona, talked to a, uh, a group at San Anse Anselm College, and here's what he said. I want to ask you about it. Jeff Flake. It has not been in my plans to run for president, but I've not ruled it out. I hope that someone does run in the Republican primary, somebody to challenge the president. I think that uh, the Republicans want to be reminded what it means to be a traditional, decent Republican. So whether it's Jeff Flake or somebody else, Serious challenge, maybe, to Donald Trump? Well, as of, as of today, I mean, what David mentioned, the people had seen, been with, uh, th there isn't that simmering resentment. But, uh, you know, w when somebody does run, Judy, as Gene McCarthy did in 1968 and exposes the weakness, or, or Ronald Reagan did with Jerry Ford, or Ted Kennedy with Jimmy Carter, it's usually because there's a perception of weakness on the part of the incumbent. Until Trump shows that, he owns the Republican Party at this point. To, to Jeff Flake's credit, he's, he's a, an insurrectionist. That's true, but a lot of people behind the scenes are making contingency plans. Post Mueller, post, post by, uh, 2018, yeah. right. they're saying we can't wait until 2019 to begin planning in case we need somebody else. So they're opening up how do we get on the ballot, how do we build a, a donor infrastructure, and they're not going to do anything if there's no Trump meltdown, but they're f suspecting there may be, and so they're beginning to plan for it. And when it comes, when it comes to, to uh, coattails in 2018, Donald Trump, and I apologize for this visual, is wearing a tank top. I mean, he, there is nothing, there's nothing there to cling to if you're a Republican. He's not going to, he's not going to carry you across the finish line. And I think that could have the greatest Im impact upon whether, in fact, there's a challenge. Well, gentlemen, uh, let it be said that on March the 16th, uh, 2018, we first talked about <laughs> 2020. <laughs> Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you both. Thank you. Now to life on the U.S.-Mexico border. This week, the president went to California to inspect models of what a new border wall could look like. As debates over the wall and immigration continue, artists and writers close to the border are trying to depict the realities on the ground. Jeffrey Brown recently traveled to Arizona, where he spent time with a writer and poet whose work has been shaped by the region. The border is a line birds cannot see. The border is where flint first met steel, starting a century of fires. Alberto Rios's 2015 poem, The Border, a double sonnet. 28 lines, each, he says, its own mini poem, and a doubled format that represents the two sides of a place often depicted in terms of conflict. But Rios sees more. I don't try to write a story about the border. I try to write a story about the 28 versions of the border, 28 things, and let them in that fragmentation try to work together, try to become something. The border used to be an actual place, but now it is the act of a thousand imaginations. Rios, a professor at Arizona State University and now Arizona's first poet laureate, was born in Nogales, son of a Mexican father and British mother. The border for me has very little to do with the wall or a fence. The border is everywhere and in everything, every step of the way in my life. My, my father was a very brown man. My mother was a very white woman. And right away, they embodied a border and that we lived in a place that had a geographical marker called the border added to that. He's seen enormous changes throughout the border region, even as its culture and language have shaped him as a writer. The border smells like cars at noon and wood smoke in the evening. So many people are, are dictating what the border ought to be, should do, and have never visited. The border is many, many things. We want to characterize it. It's like the word 
for pen. If I hold this pen up and I know that it's a pen, but that's all I can call it, I own it, that's it. That's, that's the end of the story, I, I can move on. But if that pen is also a pluma, and in another language is also a plume, if it's got three names, it must have six. And if it has six, it may have a thousand, and suddenly this thing is wild in my hand. And language does that. And language Culture does that does because that. I have to choose at any given moment how I'm going to think about this pen, how I'm going to think about the food I'm about to eat or the person I'm about to see. Mm -hmm. I have to choose. In, in a curious way, living on the border was the most American of experiences because it always gave me the coordinating conjunction or, which is the great American word. It suggests choice. You mean between two cultures? Between two between cultures, two languages? between two languages, yeah. and it also meant I had every day of my life, I don't get to just presumptively say this is a pen. I have to choose to say this is a pen because I also know it's a pluma and it's other things. So I have to choose constantly, and I, th I think people who grew up on the border are doing that all the time. The border is an equation in search of an equal sign. The border is the location of the factory where lightning and thunder are made. Rios now has a very public platform as the state's laureate. He works with young people and writes what he calls poems of public purpose. Something in me understands that I'm not always writing for myself, that sometimes I, I curious as this might sound, need to lend myself out to others who, who also need to speak. I can tell people what to do or what, they, what I think is happening. But taking the, the other tack of, of, of sharing stories, moments, things that have to do with border solutions mm -hmm. works. And now Alberto Rios' words directly reach many crossing between the two countries. His poem, Borderlines, is etched at the Mariposa port of entry in Nogales. It ends with these lines. We seem to live in a world of maps, but in truth, we live in a world made not of paper and ink, but of people. Those lines are our lives. Together, let us turn the map until we see clearly the border is what joins us, not what separates us. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown in Phoenix. And we'll be back shortly with a look at why a high-end custom tailor is giving his suits away. But first, take a moment to hear from your local PBS station. It's a chance to offer your support, which helps to keep programs like ours on the air. For those stations staying with us, practitioners of the world's most endangered language are appealing for financial assistance to save it from extinction. As special correspondent Malcolm Brabin originally reported last fall, this highly unusual form of communication is mainly used by an aging population on a Greek island. Here's a second look. You almost have to go to the edge of Europe to find the whistling village of Andia. Take a ferry from the Greek mainland to the island of Evia, past giant wind farms and a hidden waterfall. <whistles> then you encounter the unique voice of Kiriaki Yanakari, trilling as clear as a bird, chatting to her distant neighbors. It's essential we preserve this language. We have to keep it. This is the way we've grown up. And this is how they invite their friends to lunch, using a technique that distinctly transmits the message for miles between hilltops. Experts believe the language dates back to ancient Greek times. One theory is that it was created by Persians 2,500 years ago, after they were defeated in the great naval battle of Salamis. Survivors, washed up on the shores of Evia, whistled to each other to avoid detection from vengeful ancient Greeks. Paniotis Zanavaris is leading the battle to save what UNESCO considers to be the world's most endangered language. 
Whistling was used widely, used until the day the telephone arrived. That was in 1965, around the same time most young people left the village to study or find work. So it meant there was no one around to pass the language on to the next generation. It's time for the villagers to wet their whistles, and glasses of a fiery local liquor called chipporo arrive. Farmer Yanis Tsipas. If you drink too much chipporo, you get a hell of a headache. We had a festival at the church yesterday. I had far too much chipporo, and I've got a major hangover. I just have a small one right now, and I'm slowly getting back on an even keel. The villagers are at pains to stress that this is a language, not a code. If you can speak it, you can whistle it. Paniotis Zanavaris runs through the Greek alphabet. Alpha, Veda, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon. Today, there are only 18 people left who are proficient in this language. Panayotis Bounosuzis is the youngest exponent. His friend, Yanis Apostolou, acknowledges the difficulty in sustaining it. For someone who doesn't use the language on an everyday basis, he will find that after a while his mouth and jaw are becoming numb. For someone who uses the language regularly, it becomes easier the more you use it. It's like exercise. Given that most conversation takes place in short bursts using just a handful of characters, what we're listening to here is effectively the earliest known form of Twitter. So what do they think of the world's most famous Twitter user, Paniotis Bonosutis? I like President Trump. I think he's a stable influence. And I think he will take America forward. Farmer Yanis Tsipas. I think Trump is very good for his own country. I just wish he would help Greece a bit. I don't have a very high opinion of Greece's prime minister, because instead of getting us out of this financial mess, He's getting us deeper into it. Trump could assist us economically if he would pay a portion of Greece's debt. Yanis Apostolou. What I'd really like to see President Trump do is to put an end to all the wars that are going on at the moment across the world. And then to try to get people back into a normal type of rhythm and develop the rest of the world. Trump is outside the political system. Because he's an outsider and a technocrat, I think he'll find a way to resolve the situation with North Korea. Paniotis Zanavaris. It's a bit early to tell. But it's my opinion that Trump will cause fewer wars than Obama, who came to Greece and started praising democracy. The villagers acknowledge that the language is fading as fast as an Evia sunset, and they're trying to find a benefactor to fund lessons for young Greeks interested in perpetuating this unique sound of the mountains. Paniotis Zanavaris is painfully aware that financially strapped Greece has other priorities. We've got a society, a state which shows no interest whatsoever in preserving this piece of our so important cultural heritage. What he said was, for the PBS NewsHour, I'm Malcolm Brabant in Evia.
And finally, to our NewsHour shares. Christopher Schaefer has made a living crafting high-end suits. But as the NewsHour's Rana Natur reports, he's found a way to use his talents to give back to the community. From his trendy studio in downtown Baltimore, Christopher Schaefer designs custom tailored suits. It's a neat looking pattern. His shop is filled with patterned blazers, colorful ties and fabrics imported from London. And these one-of-a-kind designs, customized down to the button by Schaefer and his son Seth, start at $3,000. Everything's made from scratch. We take the person's personality and then infuse that into the garment. For a man who makes pricey suits, Schaefer has a surprising passion. He gives them away. In 2011, Schaefer started Sharp Dressed Man. It gives donated suits to men recently out of prison or rehab and looking for work. There's a lot of programs that do a lot of things for job readiness, but where Sharp Dressed Man was kind of born from was that the idea with the, what they were going to wear for the interview, they would do all this internal work, but what about the external part? And it was kind of an afterthought. In the past three years, Sharp Dressed Man has helped nearly 5,000 men, giving away 2,000 suits in 2017 alone. Thank you for bringing these in. So let me take Throughout the week, here. Schaefer collects donations from his clients and local residents. We'll look for a home for these today. Every Wednesday, he hauls the donations here, a former Woolworth department store. As the suit recipients wait to get fitted, they can get a free haircut and a hot meal. I really think that the biggest thing, though, is that you a guy gets treated with respect. And some of these guys have not been, they have not treated themselves with respect, nor been treated with respect. 23-year-old Tarad Stewart beamed as he tried on this suit, his first ever. I've been in the streets running around and catching charges and stuff like that. Really not nothing to be proud of. Now I'm older and then I'm trying to make better my life. Sean Jones is six months clean and will soon graduate from a drug recovery program. When I put the suit on, it, it, it made me feel like um, I've grown, I've matured. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a productive member of society. I'm, I'm a man. Um, it just made me feel proud. Christopher Schaefer knows about wanting a new lease on life. He was once desperate for it. I've been clean for 13 years. So that's, that's kind of where the magic happens for me, is that... Um, I'm in a situation where I'm able to help, I'm able to help other people. A lot of people can't imagine, they've never been in that situation, mm -hmm. what it's like to rebuild your life from zero. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. You gotta have a lot of courage and you need the support. You need the support. Schaefer is now supporting those at the beginning of their own transformations. Soon his son Seth will carry on that mission in Los Angeles, where he plans to open a second sharp-dressed man. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm running a tour in Baltimore, Maryland. Talk about one person making a difference. That's it. And on the NewsHour Online, right now, while Russia's presidential election is not expected to be an upset, there's plenty to dig into when it comes to how Russians are feeling and the challenges Vladimir Putin faces. You can find our analysis on our website, pbs.org slash NewsHour. And tomorrow on PBS NewsHour Weekend, Puerto Rican students displaced by Hurricane Maria adjust to school on the mainland. And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Have a great weekend. Thank you and good night. You're watching PBS.